I'm joined today by Christina Callas, writer and director of Paris is in Harlem, which is screening at the Palace Cinema on Friday, July 8th at 7.30 p.m. Christina, I really enjoyed this film. The characters, the story, the music, the setting. I mean, they all came together just to create an amazing, amazing piece of work. Um, Thank you. I, Thank you. I wasn't aware of the no dancing cabaret law before I watched this film. Um, and the fact that it was only repealed quite recently was absolutely shocking. Um, what was it about this law and the, I guess, the reality around this law and the fact that it was only repealed so recently? What was it about this that um, inspired you to create this piece? Yeah, I mean, um, and th that's a good question because uh, basically this, you know, it's not just you who is surprised at, at the existence of the cabaret law. I mean, even New Yorkers who've lived in the city forever don't know the specifics of it or, you know, it, it kind of seems bizarre in a city, in the city that never sleeps, right? Uh, I, I first noticed it when I was kind of, you know, I was seeing those uh, little things that were hanging. I mean, I have one of them in the in the film which say no dancing, please, and so on. So at some point, you know, I asked um Sam for, you know, the, the the owner of the Paris Blues, what is that? And he told me the backstory. And then I realized that it's actually still um valid and it's it's a law that started um in during prohibition. It was used to um to shut down uh, bars where, you know, jazz bars, because that's where the multiracial mingling was happening, which was, you know, not something that was agreeable to um, uh, at, at the time. And, uh, and then they continued using um, the, uh, this law uh, through the years, um, it meant that musicians, jazz musicians had to have a cabaret card. Uh, if something happened, you know, if they, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they could, this cabaret card could be taken away from them, you know, bars could get shut down. Uh, some bizarre aspects of that, like, you know, there shouldn't be more than three um, instruments on the stage at some point. I mean, parts of it were taken, uh, you know, were sort of deleted or not applied anymore during those 91 years that the law was valid, but eventually it was repealed wholly um, in, in uh, November of 2017, which is, you know, the day that I chose to sort of make it the framework of the film. Absolutely. And you chose to set the film in Harlem, and with Paris Blues being the, the bar where, where a lot of it is set. Why? Can you tell me a little bit about why you chose this location? Uh, well, you know, first of all, it's this whole idea or the whole theme that uh, there's, you know, I mean, we're, I'm kind of showing in the film the current moment, you know, I try to capture the current cultural moment uh, in New York, in, in the United States, but, you know, I feel like it's, it's you know, so I've spent a couple of months in Europe this year, it's all over the world, really, which is, you know, I call it the identity wars, or, you know, other people call it that as well, and, it, and it's just, uh, it's just, you know, a effort uh, to, um, uh, di you know, to sort of uh, be separate from each other by stressing our particular identity, whatever that is. And, um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of good coming out of that wave, uh, but there's also some things that sort of, you know, create more separation between us. And it feels like, you know, words are no help to us at the moment, at the current moment, that they're very limited. So um, music has this incredible unifying power. And um, seeing, you know, how jazz is, is basically, you know, in my eyes, the biggest contribution of America to the world. Uh, it's, it, it felt like this is, you know, this is where I should, um, where I should start. And um, I mean, I have a background as a musician myself. So, you know, my films have always something um, of a musical structure and a musical approach. Um, so it, it felt like a natural thing um, to, I mean, it was just an exciting uh, challenge to create a film that feels like jazz music. Absolutely. And I was just going to say, you intertwine the stories of so many different characters using, I suppose, split screens, but also music. Um, and in particular, I wanted to ask about the split screens because for me, it was something quite new, but it really made the viewing experience really engaging and unique. Um, can you tell me a little bit about why you chose to 
include split screens in the film? Yeah, well, split screens is something that I started um, experimenting with as a director very early on, you know, with my first uh, film. And this is the third part of a trilogy that I call the New York trilogy. And all of them have a lot of, you know, split screen experimentation. And it's really interesting because, you know, um, split screen experimentation was the first, you know, the first female filmmaker, Lois Weber, she used split screens. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> this is not why I started using split screens, but I discovered this in the process. And I was like, oh, this probably means something because it's it's kind of, you know, how maybe this how the female mind is structured, uh, is wired. I don't know, but I, I can sort of take in several um, things at the same time. And I believe that the younger generations are, are, you know, can do that as well because they're using multiple screens, right? They're on the computer, on the phone, on their iPad at the same time, and they can still take it in. Uh, they are, you know, maybe a bit smarter um, or they are, you know, differently wired. And uh, so so I, I kind of, you know, I kind of experiment this, with this narrative. I call it vertical editing. And it's really interesting because, you know, it's, it's, I, it's part of the screenplay that I shoot, so I know which parts I, I like to create a split screen off. But sometimes it's also something that, you know, one plays around with uh, during the editing phase. Um, it feels like it's it creates new meaning, you know? It's sort of, whether you, um, you, you know, put scenes, um, you know, in a, in a horizontal way, uh, put them together, or you put them simultaneously, it has a different effect you know, it creates different meanings. So I'm sort of playing around with that concept. And um, and it's also it also makes the films very much a multiple viewing um, sort of experience because every time you watch it, you sort of make different combinations in your mind. So it's a little bit more interactive, you know? So the audience is not passive, but is active, is actually participating like in a video game, you know? Yeah, that's so well put. That's definitely how I felt when I was watching it. Um, and as we said before, the music is such a central part of this film um, and you use jazz musicians playing music to help connect different scenes and storylines together. Um, I'd never seen like, like the split screens. I'd never seen anything like this done. And I thought it worked so well just to create a really cohesive link between everything. Um, can you tell me, I suppose, why you decided to connect the different scenes this way? And was it difficult to do this? Oh yeah, <laughs> you know it, it takes it takes a lot of effort to make something feel effortless. Um, so um, yeah, I mean it's it's every detail. I mean starting with how I shot the, you know I shot it with a steadicam. The whole film is shot with a steadicam. So you know as as you know a steadicam shoot is very different than. Um, than anything else because you have to choreograph everything. So combining those choreographed, this, you know, this, this um, uh, concept of choreography where, you know, the, the cam, you know, steady cam operator needs to know everything, you know, how, how it's gonna flow. So otherwise it will be constantly out of focus or out of frame, you know? And, um, but at the same time um, using that, um, improvisational tone, which is really important to me, those, you know, to create this sense of, um, of, of documentary, of cinema verite, uh, is, you know, was an interesting challenge. I, I just, you know, it was something where I didn't know if I would, you know, who would be able to pull it off. Uh, but I think it, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I think it worked out um, in the end, it kind of, you know, gives you this feeling of, um, you know, watching jazz because you, you have those moments of melody, you know, those steady come moments. And, and then you have that frenetic, those frenetic parts where all the instruments play together. And um, yeah, that's, that was the, you know, that was the thinking behind that. Well, it worked really well and created a great sense of flow. I, I really enjoyed it. And, and when you touch on the musicians there, the musicians within, within the film were absolutely fantastic. Can you tell me a little bit how you picked them and, and, who, and a bit about their background? Oh my God. I mean, those musicians, they are all stars, you know, they are, uh, they are really well known members of the jazz community uh, in New York and in the US. Um, 
And I, I basically started with Kojo Durrani, that's the, uh, the protagonist uh, in a way among many protagonists, but uh, he's the, the, the young um, prodigy drummer who is being asked to perform uh, in the bar by Sam after he, you know, he inadvertently comes into the bar with, uh, with his best friend in the gun, you know, and, and they are, um, he, he's really someone who has started playing the drums from a very young age. He's a member of the, of the Ronnie family. He's the son of Antoine Ronnie, who plays in the film. Uh, he's one of the most prolific uh, 90s jazz, musician, um, jazz musicians. And, uh, and, and the, um, the, uh, the nephew of Wallace Ronnie, you know, the, the famous uh, trumpetist. And uh, the, you know, it goes from there. I, I, I basically heard him playing in um, the New York premiere of, um, of my um, feature film, 42 Seconds of Happiness at Harlem uh, Film Festival. And I was like, who is that? You know, he was seven or eight years at the time. Wow. And now he's 12 or 13, you know, 15, uh, oh, uh, yeah, 13 um, when we started working. And um, and basically, I was I was like, OK, I need to, you know, I need to do something with this uh, with this uh, musician. And and I, you know, I looked for him for a long time. And then eventually, you know, I became good friends with his whole family. And uh, and we spent a lot of time together and it kind of grew slowly. Um, you know, Antoine would, you know, would um, uh, bring um, Camille Thurman, who is, um, who is, you know, considered the next Ella Fitzgerald, who sings the song at the end. She actually composed this song specifically for the film and, uh, and performed it for the first time on camera. And then um, mm -hmm. uh, she plays with a, you know, with a uh, Lincoln uh, Jazz Orchestra and, um, and there's Tomoki Sanders. Um, they play the saxophone in, in, uh, in the opening credits and I mean it's just it, it's uh there's there's Marlon Martinez there's William Spaceman Patterson I mean they're just amazing musicians and I'm really lucky that they kind of trusted me to um to make this film the way that I wanted to make it and um you know that was that was just an amazing experience working with these guys absolutely and this film explores, I suppose, life and death. And the dialogue you wrote in the script has the characters exploring and expressing these subjects in such a natural, conversational, yet poignant way. Um, one of the lines I really loved, Christina, was when the Uber driver said, there's a lot of songs to be heard, a lot of music to be heard. There's a lot of life to live and we've got to keep living. I thought that was just beautiful. And there's so many lines throughout the film that are just delivered in such a, just a really everyday conversational way, but have so much meaning. Can you shed some light on your writing process? Like you had to write so much dialogue for so many different characters. Like, what was it like? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's a really. Um, I think the process is 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 fun for all of us, and I kind of you know, this is a very important aspect of of my filmmaking is that this process of. Uh, preparation of development of you know is is really something that creates a group of people that are actually on the same page um, about really heavy handed things you know and really serious uh, things like as you say life and death racism sexism you know so basically the way you know I have a um, I have a Robert Altman um, uh, kind of my clee kind of approach only I start with a finished screenplay because my background is you know I worked many years as a screenwriter so I come from the writing background and um and I um I sort of you know instead of uh instead of rehearse in the classic way I workshop the screenplay the same way that you do in the theater which means that I bring together the the 
you know, the group of actors that I think would be right for this, sometimes I will not tell them which part they are. Sometimes I will try them out in a certain part and will adjust during the workshopping process because I feel that the energy of a certain actor is not exactly right for the part as I have it in my mind. And then basically the whole workshopping process is a series of improvisations um, where, you know, I sort of write the background of the characters into the, into the DNA of the actor and, 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 the, and the character. This new, you know, there's like a merging of the actor and the character while this is happening. And I also check things, you know, I will see, you know, certain provocative things that are said in the film. Uh, I would find other ways to sort of have them experience um, moments where they might, you know, be called to say that provocative thing and see, you know, how they do with it. You know, what is it? What is the, you know, what, it, what comes through? Because sometimes there's like, if you feel that, you know, an actor is, is, is not going to say uh, what you wrote on the page because they have a very different relationship to the topic, then this would, you know, sort of make me think about it, you know, sort of uh, and adjust um, as as we as we went. So it's a it's a combination of um, of you know different techniques to create as much of an authentic feel as possible, uh, something that doesn't feel that feels really like um, you're sort of. You know, sometimes I say I, I kind of create a, a story world and I go in and film it as if it were a documentary. Um, but that's not entirely true, of course, because I am giving scenes, you know, there is a very intricate um, structure um, to the film because it's, you know, it sort of pushes forward. You, you know, you can't lose the attention, you can't lose the suspense. Uh, so there's usually complicated plots um, in my films, but uh, but still to get this feeling that, you know, this is happening in real time and you're there to witness it, you know? Absolutely. That's thank you for sharing our, your process with us. Uh, it's so interesting how even the improv that we see with the jazz musicians in the film almost seems to be reflected in the way you kind of, I suppose, right. move the film together, you know, with the workshops, you kind of change things and change things accordingly based on the people and you're bouncing kind of the way you kind of felt they were delivering parts and changing the script then I, I, that's so interesting because I guess a lot of screenwriters I've spoken to before write the script and then expect people to follow it and they're quite rigid then and then they don't change it but you seem to have a lot of movement and and uh yeah it's just so interesting to hear about how you wrote how you wrote the piece yeah yeah I think you know I was I was sitting with uh, uh with a producer um the other day you know quite a sort of important producer in Germany while I was in Munich at the film festival and and you know we were talking about she was saying what do you think is next you know what topic is next or what is the theme that you know comes next or whatever and I was you know she made me think about that and I think what's next is really to change the filmmaking to change the storytelling um and that's really you know that's that's been kind of bugging me which is why I'm 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 telling stories in this way and not in the classic way of you know one protagonist the game a lot and they have an experience and we as an audience we have you know we identify with them but we're also kind of having a condescending relationship with them uh because we're looking down to this poor character who is sort of you know this is this all comes from Aristotle's poetics obviously uh and it has served us for a very long time but I feel that it doesn't serve us anymore I feel that you know, we're having a much more, which, you know, is linked to the identity wars as well. So my, my uh, you know, my effort was to sort of create um, a form or to experiment with a form of storytelling so that it's sort of closer to how I perceive the world. And how I perceive the world is, you know, multiple protagonists. Each of one is, a, each, of, each one of us is a protagonist you know and and sort of you know giving them the same uh sort of weight and and showing um their truth from their perspective 
uh, in a simultaneous way is kind of creating a new puzzle and a new truth and a new reality and and maybe more compassion and and obviously also the non-linearity of it which is much more associative and which has to do with you know I mean the split screens the way that it's time is a loop and all that um, those are elements that kind of for me are sort of um, moving in a different direction and um, and I think that you know that's it's interesting to sort of open new ground um, for for storytelling because it's not just you know there's there's a little bit an effort to open the doors for members of minorities like you know women people of color and um, you know th there's there's just uh, a lot of effort which is good um, I mean we haven't seen a lot of results yet but you know I'm sure that we will uh, but uh, basically because you know all of us are so anxious to have a seat at the table we're not even doubting the table or thinking the table but we have, you know, we kind of bring a different background, a different experience, you know, whoever, I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing us as a group, I'm just saying people who haven't been um, as, as active uh, as filmmakers because it was so tough to get into the, you know, so, so I feel that this is, that this is like the next step, you know, that we're going to be seeing much more um, different forms of storytelling because of the because of the different it's not just the stories it's not just the content but it's also the way we tell the stories right absolutely and I have to say I think I speak for a lot of people who who are going to see this film that we can't wait to see what you make next based on this one so um thank you so much Christina for joining me today Paris is in Harlem will be screened at the Palace Cinema on Friday July 8th at 7 30 p.m you could do this as actors and get paid real money. I don't want to be no actor. Yeah, he wants to be a musician. Hmm. Musician? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Pick it up, come on. Oh, yeah, don't point the gun at me. What do you play? Yeah, he plays the drums. The drums? How much money you got there? I don't know. And count it. It's two grand. Two thousand dollars. That's not much, Joe. If you think so, it's a lot to me. All right, right, right. I get it. Sure. Why don't you play something for us, huh? Try to see how you play. See, the thing is, you two seem like nice kids, and I don't think nice kids should end up in Rikers. Plus, I need the money so I can pay musicians like you and the guys over here. You see Lorenzo over there? Now he plays a mean drum solo. I bet he could teach you. You ever played on a proper drum set? Yeah. I'm pretty sure you've never played on a set like those. Lorenzo has the king of the skin bashing world. Is it not, Lorenzo? All right, man. <laughs> Come on, there ain't no harm for you to play a little. 